Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 371 for March 30th of 2017, Inside Honda's Fuel Cell Strategy. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Mr. B, V, how you be? I be doing great. How about yourself, John? <laughs> if I can talk, I'll be doing great on yeah, this show. Yeah, you're going to need to talk on this show. <laughs> I know. Well, we got to let everybody know, Henry Payne is back in the house. Hey, John. Gary, good to be with you. Car critic with the Detroit News. Also political cartoonist. Yeah. The only one I know who has ever made that kind of transition in his <laughs> career. And race yeah. car driver. The last time we had him on the show, he had yeah. his car in the studio. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that was fun. But we've got him back here today because we want to be talking about the Honda Clarity. And the reason we want to do that is we've got Steve Center. He's the Vice President of Environmental Business Development Office at American Honda. Steve, great having you here. Thanks for having me. And, and you got the Clarity here. Right which there, in the flesh. In the flesh. And you guys started leasing this in California, what, in December in of 2016? December. Right. We had uh, some of our uh, initial Clarity drivers from the previous generation car insisted that they get first crack at the new one when it came out. So we had a nice little homecoming and a ceremony, and we delivered uh, six or seven cars at the same time, and uh, everyone was very excited. Good way to kick it off. So this is basically the second, I mean, you've, you've had other fuel cell vehicles in the past, I mean, going back as far as 2003 that right. you've, you've made available, but this is... Arguably the second generation of a car that is commercially available to people, in, at least in California. Yes, for sure. Um, it's the third generation of a fuel cell car that we've leased okay. to people. The uh, predecessor to this, the FCX Clarity, was the first uh, purpose-built fuel cell car built on an assembly line. Hmm. And uh, this one is an extension of that. It's a complete model change. Everything is new about this, and uh, uh, there's more story to that as well. Yeah, because, I mean, this is also, Steve, part of a, a, a much larger initiative by Honda, right? I mean, the Clarity is not just a fuel cell vehicle anymore. It is now a, a badge that represents uh, uh, a plug-in electric vehicle and Honda's larger commitment to, go, to selling two-thirds of its vehicles uh, electrified by 2030. I couldn't have said it better yeah. myself. I mean, Thank you. Sort of the, a, a new icon, really. Yeah, we for, want to make it a pillar line uh, for the brand, just like uh, Civic is or Accord is. And uh, there's three incarnations. There's the fuel cell vehicle, which is uh, for what uh, we think is the uh, apex customer, the one that has to have the latest, greatest technology. We're going to have a battery version, which is for someone who's more or less a purist and uh, doesn't want to have anything to do with petroleum. And the third is a plug-in hybrid, uh, which uh, is kind of a tweener in that people that want to get in the game but maybe don't live in an environment where there's uh, uh, hydrogen fueling yet or uh, can't really commit to a battery entirely because their drive habits are different or their life is irregular. So, so tell, us, tell us about the features of this new Clarity and what you learned from the previous generation owners. Yeah, we worked very closely with them. In fact, one of the... Uh, uh, customers that we delivered the car to was the first fuel cell customer ever that, that ever leased the car. And we learned from him early on because uh, the exhaust from a fuel cell uh, uh, is water. And uh, the car was making a puddle in its garage and uh, his kids were complaining about the puddle in the garage. So uh, we brought that information to the development team back then and when the predecessor to this car was introduced, uh, it didn't create puddles. It held the water and disposed of it underway. This one is an evolution from that in that it operates at a higher temperature, and uh, it really doesn't create water. It creates steam, mm -hmm. so it's just gone. Talk about the car, too. I, this is a big car. This is the biggest passenger car, I believe, that Honda makes, and, and there's a reason why you went with five passengers. Yes. Um, what uh, we heard from our customers, again, was um, they didn't want a, a four-passenger car. And uh, previously, the way the car was designed, 
you only had room for the four passengers. You had a fuel cell stack that was interior to the passenger compartment. And we've really achieved a, this is a highly evolved car. The entire powertrain is under the front hood. So that's the power control unit, the uh, fuel cell stack, and the electric motor. And all of that is about the size of a V6 engine. And what that means is there's all this room in the passenger compartment now, and uh, we can have five passengers. But also it means that we've got the power plant down to the size and compactness that anything with a V6 could be a fuel cell car going forward, and that's a huge achievement. So we could see an Odyssey minivan, a Ridgeline pickup, possibly in theory. In theory. Okay. In theory. Okay. And that's a big thing because it means that we can keep – uh, designing cars the way we're designing them and not having the pigeonhole part of the powertrain here and something else there. Well, and, 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 and keeping that thought on the V6, um, uh, right now the package would fit in a V6 space. You're, you're competing against Toyota's Mirai, um, against um, uh, Hyundai's Tucson, which are, which are four, four-cylinder Santa transfer. Fe, isn't it? Uh, it's a Tucson fuel sub. I think it's a Tucson, Tucson? Okay. yeah. Um, and, and they do have those space issues. The, the Mirai still is a four-passenger right. car because the, I mean, do, do you feel like um, the package is going to continue to get smaller so that you'll be able to put it, put it into four-cylinder vehicles, or do you really need a car this size for, for both the drivetrain packaging and the, the, the interior space that passengers expect? Well, I think for now the answer is this is the size. Mm -hmm. But uh, the energy density of these uh, uh, devices is improving, and they're going to get smaller and smaller and more efficient as as these things do. So you might see civic size cars or even smaller cars in the future. But uh, at this point, the goal was to get it all under the hood so that uh, we'd have the uh, freedom in the passenger compartment to give uh, customers what they wanted. Well, th and that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of what eats up a lot of space, of course, is the tank itself, which has got to right. be cylindrical. And in fact, you guys have gone with two tanks, a big one and a small one. Right, and that's for range. So we have uh, the uh, large tanks across the rear axle where typically you put those, and even petrol tanks are, are placed there because it's away from any interference. And we have a smaller tank that's uh, under the uh, back seat position, and... Uh, that gives us uh, extra volume so that we can achieve a 366-mile EPA range for the car. And I, I did some math this morning just out of curiosity, um, and I looked at the V6 Accord, which has a 17.2-gallon fuel tank, mm -hmm. so it has a range of 430 miles. So you guys are really in the ballpark with that, yep. with this vehicle. So it's, Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's not a compromise. I mean, this is, this is I think, one of the issues that, that people might think that if you buy a fuel cell vehicle, You've got to compromise in some way. But, and, and, and this was what's tough for any of these alternative drives, right? There's always, it's, it's, it's better than what? So you guys have a superb hybrid product. And actually, I think most of the customers for this car are going to be coming out of hybrid fleets, whether they're Honda or Toyota mm -hmm. uh, folks. And if you're coming out of a Honda Accord hybrid, it has a range of 750 miles on a 15-gallon tank that costs you 50 bucks to fill. This thing right now, I mean, you guys have a program where you're basically giving the fuel for free, but hydrogen fuel, comparable, uh, is $90 a fill-up. So your competi the, the Honda Clarity's competition yeah. is the, the Honda Accord Hybrid. That's tough competition. Right, and some of it's a psychographic, but I want to address the fuel situation. The prices are coming down. And as scale in the uh, fueling infrastructure develops and scale in the manufacturing of the fuel develops. So at this point, there are stations in Los Angeles that are charging just under $10 a kilogram. And uh, it's a five, a little more than five kilogram tank. So the, the price is much, much less. But it's about equivalent to the same cost per mile as a petrol car, not a hybrid, just a straight up petrol car. So we think we're getting in the hunt as far as uh, that's concerned. But um, also the uh, uh, Accord Hybrid is a wonderful car. And what's wrong with an Accord that gets uh, 49 uh, miles per gallon? Mm -hmm. So, See, isn't this bad? They they you know are competing with themselves. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> but, but it's a psychographic. It's a different customer. It's so why does why does want this car? Why why you know, is this is your um, alpha influencer? This is the person who's the first guy amongst all your friends to get an iPhone, 
right? The one that knows everything about cameras, the one with the best investment advice. So it's a psychographic. And there's other customers for the other two uh, clarities that will be introduced later this year. Uh, there's someone who's a purist, and they're probably the battery buyer. And then again, there's someone who wants to get in the game but really can't make the sacrifices or commitment, and that's the plug-in hybrid buyer. So I would say anyone that's uh, considering a clarity or will consider a clarity is at the extreme psychographic. And a cord hybrid buyer is someone who just doesn't want to deal with uh, any kind of inconvenience or change, and uh, they just want the benefit. Mm -hmm. Right, and they're different, and they're different demographics. Right, you know, and there's different a... geographies also, to be right. honest. Battery cars have challenges in colder weather. That's something that is a, is a reality. It's a part and of so it. you don't have a problem with these, even in bitter cold weather. There's no problems with the. Not to the same cars. extent. There's no there's no problems with them, and because you can refuel in three to five minutes, you know, with your petrol car, you don't have the same efficiency in very cold weather either. But you don't notice because when you need gas, you need gas. And unless you're keeping track of the miles per gallon and the weather on every tank, you're never going to notice But there's that. always been this issue, though, with, with fuel cells that, you know, because they make water and because there's water in the stack, that there's yeah. a concern that, you know, you'll go out to your uh, garage someday in, in Michigan in January. And There'll be a big ice cube yeah, blowing ice cube, out from but, but you guys even in yeah, March yeah, or yeah. maybe even June. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the benefit of maybe being on your fifth generation car. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got uh, uh, air that evacuates the uh, fuel cell stack mm -hmm. to get the moisture out of that. So it's not, a, not an issue. The, no. the other thing I was uh, getting at when talking about the size of the car is you have a decent trunk. Because when I've looked in other fuel cell cars in the past, I mean, there's no room back there. What's, the right. tank takes up all the room. And that's another value, I think, that you got with going with a size. Sure, like and we learned that with hybrids, too. Some of the early hybrids, you compromise the trunk space. People want their trunk. And uh, we did the best we could. I think there's about 11.8 cubic feet of trunk space. Um, the tank is up over the uh, axle, as I said before. It'll hold three golf bags and... Uh, couple of runs to the big market. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty confident everyone will be happy with that. Steve, I, uh, um, uh, you know, we love driving the cars and, and uh, crawling all over them. When I came back from driving this in California, the, the first questions I got from uh, friends and neighbors was, uh, how safe was the hydrogen? I mean, I, I think that's a big piece of, of your all's public relations here. Uh, to, to, to buyers with a tank, a hydrogen tank in the back, and all the baggage that hydrogen comes from, from the, from the Hindenburg on down. How do, you, how do you say to people, you're safe if you get, if you get rear-ended by, by a Chevy Suburban? Right. So, first of all, let, let's settle a couple of things. It was the paint that burned on the Hindenburg, <laughs> okay? But, uh, and the magnesium frame. Yeah, exactly. But um, to be truthful... Um, you're driving around in that uh, Suburban, not to pick on Suburbans, they're fine cars. They're, they're loaded up with petrol, and those actually have uh, uh, the same issue uh, as well. Uh, this vehicle meets all the crash standards. We've also developed other countermeasures to make sure it's even safer, let's say, in design. So the uh, fuel tank is uh, fail-safe, so when it's safe to operate, the valve opens and the system's fueled. If uh, there's a leak, there are sensors in the back of the car and under the hood that detect that can detect hydrogen and will shut down the fuel system. And uh, if there's a crash and an airbag is deployed, the fuel system is shut down. So the other thing on top of that is that hydrogen is the lightest molecule in the universe. So if it does get loose, it just goes straight up and it's gone. It's not all over the floor or all over your pants. So um, we're very confident that it's it's a very safe way to propel the car. And in, in refueling it, I found it very similar to refueling a natural gas car. Yep. Uh, similar, similar nozzle, similar mm -hmm. filler. Uh, the advantage you guys ha have, obviously, is, is you're trying, you're, uh, as opposed to natural gas, which really seems <laughs> to have stalled as an alternative because it means going these days mostly to utilities to get your right. fuel. You guys are trying to bring it to we uh, service stations. Lot. We learned a lot from consumers with our natural gas Civic. And what they didn't want to do is go to uh, a city utility yards and fill up next to uh, uh, dump trucks and garbage trucks. They want to go to a gas station with a convenience store. They want to buy a lottery ticket. They want to buy milk. They want to be comfortable. They want to have a bathroom for the kids. So um, we've been working very hard on the distribution side of the infrastructure 
to uh, provide resources to companies who are creating uh, hydrogen lanes in existing gas stations. And as a result, there's 26 stations, uh, retail stations open in California. Um, right now, I think 16 in the south, 10 in the north. There's connector stations uh, between them. And uh, what we're finding is now everyone's starting to see that business opportunity. So even the petrol companies who have huge amounts of uh, footprints with stations and site control, and uh, they're looking to get in the game again too. So it's a bit of a ratcheting up where you have, um, uh, you have to create the demand for the fuel, put some cars in the market, have enough fueling to support that, put more cars in the market, more fueling, and so on. So uh, we, we learned a lot about it. Hey, we got to take a quick break right now because we got some people that support the show and we got to let them get their message into this as well. So, Carmen, let's give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. Okay, we're back talking about the Honda Clarity fuel cells, hydrogen with Steve Center from American Honda. Thank you. Steve, Steve, tell us about the design of this car. I mean, it, it looks somewhat futuristic. Was that deliberate? Absolutely. People, again, we're talking about psychographics that are these early adopters. They want uh, people to see that they're driving something unique. So we worked very hard to develop a, a car that was aesthetically pleasing, that was futuristic looking, but also there was function beyond uh, just the uh, form. So you might notice on the car there are uh, vents in the front and on the side, and what those vents do is create air curtains to flood the wheel compartments with air to create um, a less drag mm -hmm. to increase the aerodynamics now, of the car. The, the air curtains have been used on other, I think, the Ford F-150 pickup and the like uses them, but you've incorporated them into so the rear we're the, door. We're the first with it. So there's a slot halfway through the rear door, which runs straight back, and then there's also a bit of a skirt on the top of the fender. So uh, when uh, you're building a car like this, efficiency matters. Um, we developed the car to slip through the air. Uh, air goes over the car, goes under the car where it's smooth, and uh, we're working on uh, other areas where there's interference and chatter. It's uh, aerodynamic detail like we've never seen before in a car. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it also seems to me, though, that the, that the um, alternative fuel community is kind of getting their own iconic style um, uh, uh, style details. The, you have the, 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 the uh, cut uh, rear fenders, which mm -hmm. we've seen on the, your Insight before. Right. And explain uh, that a little bit, Harry, uh, Henry, because it's, it's not a full wheel well. It's Yeah, that's a better description. Some, of, right. Somewhat covering a bit of the rear tire, again, for aero. Yeah. It's, it's not quite the uh, uh, fender skirt on well, your uh, yeah, the Hudson. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or the yeah. 60s yeah. hot rods. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but it has function, yeah. and that's the purpose. So between the uh, air curtain and the uh, lower uh, uh, rear quarter panel, uh, that achieves what we want. Yeah. So that, that's, that's just part of the genre. Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's a bit of a visual cue, I think, as to what you're dri driving. And, I, and also the double rear window. Right. Which you, you have see a high on back. Bolts, you see on Priuses, you see on this car. Right. So for aerodynamics, you have a, a taller rear on the car, but you still need to be able to see over that, or in this case, through it. So there's a uh, skylight uh, over the back seat and through the uh, trunk mm -hmm. lid which just helps you understand what's around you when you're driving. And I think you guys pioneered that on the CRX way back in the day. Way uh -huh. back in the day. Yeah, good memory. Uh -huh. Way back Steve, in the as day. You, you mentioned, it's the early adopters who want this right. car, and they are going to want it no matter what. The availability is going to be very limited of this car. I think Honda's talked about maybe selling only 200 in Japan. Maybe it's a bit more here. Uh, much more. Thousands. Thousands here. Thousands in the U.S. But you've got the most killer lease of killer leases. <laughs> it's like, what, 369 a month? 369 a month. Well, gets 20,000 miles. A year. A year. This, this is a 36? 36-month 36 lease. A lot of folks that acquire these cars, especially in California, are long-distance runners. So we don't want them to worry about mileage. But the coup de grace is the fuel. And because the fueling infrastructure right now is maturing, uh, there's a little bit of inconvenience, perhaps. The prices are adjusting. So what we wanted to do was uh, not to have people worry about the pricing or translating kilograms to gallons and doing all of this uh, high school, college math when they're filling up the car. So we're providing them with $15,000 worth of fuel 
which ought to cover the whole. Which is lease. what it's a credit card that they. Yeah, can it's use, a fuel right? card, and it's uh, only good for hydrogen fuel. So. Yeah. You, okay, you, but wait, there's more. Keep talking. There's <laughs> well, more to this lease yet. Well, sometimes you may feel the need for a Vegas run or a trip out of the hydrogen zone. So we're offering 21 days of luxury car rental. And you go to with, what? Avis, Avis, and you can rent a luxury car for Whatever free. Whatever luxury car they have that you want. And this way, you're traveling in style on your uh, weekend away or um, wherever you're going. But wait, there's more. How's that? The $5,000 rebate uh, from the state of yeah, California. Yeah. So California's got some money. The feds have money, too. The federal money's applied into the lease price, so that's already there. And that's a tax credit, so you have to pay taxes to get it. But we get it. But you're leasing it, it so you bake that into right. the lease. So we get it, and we pass it on. And the state's offering $5,000 and a carpool lane sticker, which might be worth a lot more than $5,000 if, <laughs> if you <laughs> ask the right person. And the five person. grand goes to whoever leases That goes that. to the lessee. You get a check from the state. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it. if you do the math, this is about as sweet a deal as sweet I, I did the math, get. and I want to say it's a little over $270 a month with no fuel costs whatsoever. And why are you doing this? Like, you, you, you know the early adopters in California are right. going to be lined up to get this vehicle, and you guys are giving them a screaming deal. Well, it's like the food court at the mall. You ever go through there and there's a lady with a piece of chicken on a toothpick and, and try this? <laughs> <laughs> so we want everybody to try it because the early adopters, you're right, they're, they're predisposed so that uh, uh, Alpha Influencer is online already. But we want the others uh, to consider the car because we want this to be a mainstream choice for consumers going you know, you, forward. You mentioned that someone can get a luxury car. I mean, one of the things that impressed me about this vehicle is the interior? I mean, it, it is it is a very nice interior. Mm -hmm. It is it's not sort of like, gee, we'll we'll just use vinyl because it's cheaper. And I mean, you you guys have executed very well on that. These, these guys went uh, completely to the extreme, and the uh, design concept was a cool modern lounge. So when you look at the inside, it's very clean. The lines are clean. There isn't any clutter. There's a, a center stack screen which also uh, includes features such as our Honda sensing. So when you turn on the uh, turn lane signal to the right, there's a camera on the mirror which uh, films your blind spot so you don't have to crank your head all the way around. So um, there's functionality in there. It's clean, it's roomy, it's spacious, it's roomier than an Accord inside. And uh, the purpose was it should be luxurious. It's leading edge technology. There shouldn't be a penalty. But but yeah. but to but to that point, Steve, you guys have a luxury brand. Uh, and we, we did the we were doing the math. You mm -hmm. love this, John. We're doing the math in the car. It's basically 150 a month for the, for the for the California tax credit. You're saving about 200 dollars in fuel a month. You're looking at you're looking at a sub 100 dollar lease mm -hmm. when you get these things early. So I mean, you got journalists who are ready to go out and buy <laughs> these things. Even poor that journalists. Means it's rate. a good deal. <laughs> but but still. The raw number is 369. Yeah. I mean, that's accurate territory. I think the RDX um, is leasing for 400, 420 these days. So you're, you're up in, in, in high-end accurate territory with this. Why not make the Clarity and Acura? Why Honda? That's a good question. I think uh, mostly because of the global impact and uh, the uh, position was to raise the Honda brand's uh, environmental credential even further. So uh, Acura is in its own space, and that's about precision crafted performance, and the theming for Honda is clean, safe, and fun. But does Acura get a piece of this? I mean, uh, this would be good for that brand. Who knows what happens in the future? It's V6 size. All right, so, so, so the point of, of, of performance now, I mean, we've all driven it, and certainly you've driven it more than once. I mean, it, it, it gets after it. I mean, you get on the accelerator, and you have that. It, it's, it's, it's like sport well, mode. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it's... Uh, Tires squeak. Although I will say, like many electric cars, great off the line or as soon as you tip into it. Loses a little bit of oomph once you keep your foot in it a while. But I think that's the nature of electrics, too. Well, they give you a steady, straight uh, power curve. This car will... Uh uh, top out about 5,000 RPM, which is electric RPM. It's not the same as an internal combustion engine, but it's uh, it's steady, it's quiet, it's uh, consistent. Yeah. And again, there's two modes. So push that uh, sport mode, and you won't be saying that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but but uh, uh, it is familiar if you if you've driven a, a, a Tesla Model S. I mean, it's it's a big sedan, but it it goes right off the line. But I think the 060s are going to come in around the eight-second eight range, we're told. 
Um, and eight could, seconds is very acceptable. That's okay, but uh, could you guys, with a fuel cell, could you do what Tesla does with its Model S? Could you go for uh, ludicrous times in the three-second I range? guess it, it's just a matter of the brand. I mean, anything can be done. How much fuel do you want to use? Honda's a pretty sporty brand. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> how much efficiency do you want to lose? Right, and that's, that's that space. I think uh, it's a little bit... Um, disingenuine to have a environmental car that's guzzling down its own fuel, even yeah. if it's hydrogen. <laughs> have a have a separate no, have a separate NOx tank, you know, to just inject yeah. it. When they... <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned Japan. We know it's being sold in California. Where mm -hmm. else in the world will this car go? Well, we are working with uh, different uh, groups in the Northeast to create fueling infrastructure there as well. California is a little easier, large geography, one government, the Northeast is a little more diverse in terms of geographies and governments, but we think there'll be a pretty healthy fueling infrastructure there within two years, and we're looking forward to that market opening up as well. So and this is in other countries? Uh, there are Germany's many, talking Ger uh, Germany's big been big on hydrogen, and I think uh, we're focusing right now on the U.S. just because it's, it's one market it's easier to deal with. And uh, this is the plan for the future. Um, this isn't just a, uh, a U.S. market car, and it isn't just a, uh, a car for uh, California. Are you, are you concerned, though, Steve? I mean, green governments are, are fickle bodies. I mean, we're seeing that in Europe now with diesel. D diesel was heavily favored by the regulators. Now they decide they don't like them. Um, and they're going to take the tax benefits away and whatnot, we, we presume. Uh, are, are you afraid? Uh, is there is there concern there with hydrogen? Because not not all environmentalists like hydrogen. It takes an enormous amount of energy to separate hydrogen from water. There's a lot of criticism that that's too carbon intense in itself. Um, how do how do you see the future it, playing out? It all out? depends on how you see it. Um, if you look at where the energy comes from, if you consider things like wind or solar, of which we probably waste 99.99999% of the energy that we have and store it as hydrogen, um, then you don't have the same issues because the efficiency is, is less, less of an issue. So I, I think you have uh, that aspect to it. Um, our uh, plan going forward uh, is environmental powertrains. And uh, with clarity, as we mentioned earlier, there's three incarnations. So we're ready for each market as they develop at their own rate, their own pace, and their own place. You know, it's interesting that, that hydrogen actually is, is a gas that comes off of many chemical processes that now is just basically it's thrown away. away, right. So uh, you, could, you could capture it. Also, it stores very well. So if you have a lot of sunshine or a lot of wind and you're using that to hydrolyze water, let's say, um, the hydrogen, you store it in the tank, and 100 years later, it's still hydrogen and it's still there. So it can be stored as a gas. And I think you don't have that with batteries, uh, for sure, because batteries... Or even, degrade. you know, gasoline or diesel fuel go bad over Go stale, year. right. So uh, we really think... Um, there's a, a, a huge benefit to this. There's a lot of naysayers. Governments are in and out of it. We're, we're in it for the long haul, and I think it's going to find its place, and eventually it's going to be a leading fuel. Do you, do you think hydrogen will be the end game as, as we're going forward in terms of these technologies? I, I think so for a lot of different reasons. Um, batteries are important, but uh, they have limitations as, as we sit here today, and I think... Um, Hydrogen is a fuel that can be made in many different ways. You can even make it from natural gas, and you can say, oh, that's not good. But if it's natural gas that is uh, renewable, if it's uh, methane from landfills or other things, that's not creating any new carbon. The whole point is not to add carbon to the chain. When it produces water, which uh, Californians need to water their that, lawn. Yeah. So. Well, and uh, we have a, a feature in Japan, in the Japan market, uh, with a power exporter that we make, where this uh, will uh, output electricity. And uh, for those of you that uh, have frequent power uh, issues at your home, you can uh, potentially use a car like this to power your home, and you can run it inside with the garage door down because A, it won't make a puddle, and B, it won't make carbon monoxide. So <laughs> I could have used that in Detroit a couple of weeks ago in that big power outage, the biggest we've had in our DTE's history. Absolutely. Hey, look, we got to take a, another quick break where you've got Dr. Data coming out right after that, but we still got plenty more to talk about hydrogen, fuel cells, and the Honda Clarity. So, Carmen, let's take that quick break right now.
This is 37 seconds in the Autoline Garage. Here are some secrets of the second generation Honda Ridgeline. Take the tailgate for instance. Most of its competitors are pretty straightforward, but the Ridgeline opens both ways. They say it's dual action. Then giving a quick look at the bed of the truck, you see, well, you don't see anything, unless you know where to find the secret in-bed trunk, where you can put everything from luggage to your favorite tailgate beverages. And speaking of tailgating, this truck is ready for any kind of party with its own in-bed audio system that you can control from inside the truck. But of course, the biggest Ridgeline secret is the way this truck drives, quiet and smooth. This has been 37 seconds in the Autoline Garage. And of course, what you just heard is some of the things that we're trying out right now of doing very quick car reviews, only 37 seconds. In fact, if you look in another few days or so, you're gonna see a 37 second car review of the Honda Clarity because I just finished writing that one. But anyway, it's that part of the show. It's time for Dr. Data. All right, so I didn't realize how topical this was gonna be when I came up with this number, okay? so. Henry, you may get it right like that, but and, and Steve, you, you may want to chime in and, and guess what this number may be. So Carmen, please bring up the first number. Okay, so 106,000 cars, 22,000 vans and trucks, 2019. What could be happening then? I'll take a guess. All right. That'll be the cumulative number of fuel cell cars and vans and trucks on the road. Mm. All right, right, Henry, now I want you to guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say electrics. <laughs> electrics, okay. None of the above. Mm. And it was a topic we talked about, but uh, nobody's going to guess this. I, 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 you want to take a shot at it? I couldn't. All right, so, <laughs> Carmen, bring up the answer. So, Barcelona <laughs> is going to have the most uh, severe yes, law trying to ban diesel. Henry, I know that's going to break your heart. Love you're, diesels. You're, you love diesels. Love I know that. Diesel. I know. And uh, so, so basically, we're seeing a number of European countries. Uh, they're forcing are, the older ones out. They're forcing the older ones out because of, of levels of pollution. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you look at what's going on in London, in Paris, and so Barcelona will be the largest municipality anywhere on the planet that is going to restrict those vehicles and completely yes, fickle, fickle governments. Diesel was all they wanted 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. 20 so there years. You 10 go. years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, how quickly, how quickly the winds change. Yeah, in their defense though, those are the older ones and, right. and things have improved since then. So I, I think uh, it's just like California where uh, they have a scrappage program where um, if your car fails the smog exam, uh, they'll buy it from you because they don't want you fixing it and they don't want it back out there. Or if it's older than a certain year and it passes, they'll give you 500 bucks for it just to get it off the road. Yeah. So, Let's hope, hope Silicon Valley keeps printing money out there. Yeah, $5,000 tax credit here, 500 salvage there. Yeah, and that's from a, uh, an entity that doesn't create its own money supply <laughs> <laughs> right. like a federal government. Yeah. So... You, you have to deal with all manner of environmental issues in addition to hydrogen and addition to hydro, or in addition to hybrids. Um, you know, so, so what are the challenges that you face in, in doing your job? Well, there's, there's the business challenge. So uh, I'll give you an interesting example. So one of the responsibilities that uh, my group has is to reduce the carbon footprint for the company. One is the products that we make, which is the bigger carbon footprint, but a lot of it is internal. So some of the things we do is we analyze different uh, operational centers for their energy intensity and what kind of investments can we make um, to reduce those. And what you'll uh, see is that um, there's uh, a guns or butter kind of analysis for everything. So we tell a factory that's uh, in a part of the country where there's coal power, we'd like to see them adopt uh, solar. And the answer is, yeah, <laughs> you know, we want a new paint booth. And so what we've done is we've made a couple of organization changes and we budget a certain amount uh, every year to go towards those products and look at, look at the most uh, carbon de-intensifying investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's one of the, uh, the things that we work on. Um, there's also, uh, we're studying a carbon tax internally to uh, uh, cause uh, different uh, groups to understand the cost to society perhaps of what they're doing 
or the product. So if you look at some of our products, which aren't as fuel efficient as some of the others, so you have a Fit and you have a, an Odyssey or a Pilot, which of course are all wonderful cars, but um, how many Fits would you have to sell when the market doesn't want as many Fits to make up for one of the larger cars? So internally, we're looking at applying different kinds of... So uh, you're going to have a Honda cap and trade uh, scheme going might, on? We might have to do that to, get, you do that? to get the I people mean, to realize that. Well, we're studying it, and a lot of other companies have done that. Microsoft does that. Other companies have done that. And we brought it up a couple of times. Uh, we have a North American Environmental Committee, and we're looking at ways, at the very least, to raise people's awareness, because right now it's not on the radar. When you're developing a product, you've got cost targets, you've got safety targets, you've got weight targets, you've got feature targets, you've got price targets, all of these things, but there isn't really the carbon uh, target. There's a fuel economy target, which is sort of a proxy for it, but not really, because the uh, federal government has uh, all kinds of uh, um, greenhouse gas requirements, and that's based on the roll-up of the whole fleet. So um, we need to balance what uh, we're creating or to understand where we could perhaps invest a little more to reduce that in some products, because otherwise there might be a tax or a penalty on the development team where there wouldn't be. But, but so. Stephen, in terms of the market, don't, don't you think you have to have a consumer penalty of some, some sort? I mean, you, you're going to go back to the diesel example in Europe, huge uh, a tax subsidy for diesel in Europe just to to get the consumer involved. I mean, you guys want to go two-thirds electric in 13 years. Globally, globally. Yeah, in the last, I mean, we've, we've been a hybrid, hybridized battery society for 17 years now, mm -hmm. essentially, and they are 3%, less than 3% of the U.S. market. And that's very ambitious on your part. How do you, how do you possibly get there without taxing the well, consumer? Um, well, in a, in a sense, the market has to pay for everything, ideally. My, my background's actually in economics. So there has to be a, a market demand for everything that you do. Um, in our case, uh, we, we're a business. So we, we can't afford to print money, can't afford to lose money. Um, what we need to do is to get scale, do a lot of R&D and bring those costs down so that there isn't the tax, so to speak, or the penalty on the consumer and provide the product that delivers the the features that they want. So it's a huge challenge. But when you look at some of the uh, concerns in society, and we're a company that believes um, uh, climate change is an issue and that it needs to be addressed. And uh, if you uh, consider this, so uh, the Wall Street guys are asking those questions. Um, years ago, I used to go around and do the, Wall uh, the road show. And the fund managers that all uh, own the company and make the investments started asking, what are you guys doing about CO2? And this is going back maybe 10 years ago. And I'd scratch my head and I'm thinking, where is that question coming from? And I asked one of them after a meeting and the guy looks at me and says, oh, you don't get it. He goes, you're tobacco. Oh, yeah. yeah. The next okay? tobacco. And, and we consider that to be a, a true business risk. So we're working very hard not to be part of the problem and to be part of the solution. So again, it, it's R&D and it's uh, creating products that people want on their own merit that don't uh, create the but, but Henry too. makes a great point. I mean, the, the number of people buying green cars, if you will, is shrinking. It's shrinking in sales numbers. It's shrinking in market share. Now, within that group, yeah, uh, plug-ins are going up, hybrids are going down, electrics are, are actually going up too, but as a group, it's not increasing. Right, so we, we have to provide uh, products that uh, uh, give those benefits without the penalty. And, and it's an R&D challenge. Like I said before, what's wrong with an Accord that gets 49 <laughs> miles per gallon if it's priced right? Mm -hmm. So with uh, scale right. comes the pricing. That well, it's but, interesting because, I mean, you could make the argument that basically, I mean, you guys, because I, I was looking at the Earth Dreams technology that, mm -hmm. that had been announced, you know, out of Japan. I mean, so this is, this is a corporate initiative to have, you know, much more fuel efficient engines and transmissions. And I was thinking, oh, this is maybe where they were doing work on, on hydrogen. No, this is, this is just purely the internal combustion engine it's part of it. Everything. Yeah. So, so basically the, the, the regular Accords and the regular Civics that are being sold out there in, in vast numbers are themselves green vehicles. Without in, in, that, in that sense, we have a chart that just shows today and then going out, let's say, 30 or 40 years. And uh, it's just kind of a 
growth curve for volume. If this is 100% of what we sell, today it's just about all our internal combustion. And 30 uh, years from now, it's zero pure internal combustion. Not that many hybrids, but more things like plug-ins, electric, and fuel cells. Yeah. So it's really a, a big transition. And for a company that's an engine company, there's a lot of uh, mental adjustments that people have to make to get their heads wrapped around Well, a that. fuel cell, yeah. kind of a motor, I suppose. Well, you know, it's, it's a different skill set, and you, you also have... Uh, uh, different people joining the organization. You know, you have people that grew up with computers and uh, a whole different mindset about things and electrification. So, um, again, R&D, R&D, R&D. Yeah. But, I, 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 and, and, I mean, again, to get back to the competitive set, you guys make really good gas engine-powered things. And, and you have, and you've, you've hit, I mean, you, you guys make a lot of money in this market. I mean, uh, uh, I think 40 percent of your product globally is sold here. You guys, you guys get the American consumer. And unlike those Wall Street guys, yeah. the American consumer, if you, if you ask them where global warming ranks on their list of priorities, it's down here. As long as they don't have to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. But, but when their ankles are wet, they may start to care, but then it's too late. Yeah. But, but, but you make very good CRVs. You guys have hit the sweet spot of the SUV market. Um, why not an SUV here? Mm. Why? I mean, uh, I mean, I'd we, say no. The, the doctor, start somewhere, right? <laughs> okay. I, don't, I don't want Dr. Data to I get out his no. sedan yeah. here. But. <laughs> yeah, well, this, you know, back after uh, in 08, when the economy crashed, there was a lot of discussion about, oh, what's going to be? What was us? Are we going to have a lost decade like Japan? And there were a lot of products getting canceled and a lot of new products being considered. And I remember sitting in a room and I turned to my boss at the time, and he's the head of... Um, global product, uh, I said, um, you know, I think we're going to get back to business as usual here pretty soon because uh, we want what we want. And uh, that's part of the American psyche. So um, Americans want SUVs. It's a uh, form factor. It's not uh, just it's, American. It's lifestyle. It, well, this is a global shift. Well, it, some, some of it is for... Um, you know, it started with minivans, really, and station wagons, so it, it goes way back. It, it's the functionality of the car, and some of it's bling and, and that gangster factor and other things like that. But uh, people want this form factor, and we'll have the kind of powertrains that uh, those vehicles need to have to be pleasing, but also to be environmentally sensitive. So I didn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why... Why do so few companies offer fuel cells right now? I think they don't have the technology or the vision. Um, and uh, it's a lot easier not to do your setups. But if you have a good, strong core, you're going to be healthier and you're going to enjoy things more. You, you've co-developed this with GM? And there's no. A, is there some GM? Nothing. In this, in, this, in this product, no. But we've had a joint R&D project with GM since 2011. And what we did was we took the two companies that had the uh, most patents between uh, of, of all the automakers on uh, automotive fuel cell technology and threw everything in and then developed a next generation fuel cell stack. So it's next from this. Hmm. Roughly the same size, but drive the cost out. And remember, I said R&D, R&D, R&D. And we announced a couple of weeks ago here in Detroit uh, the announcement of a joint manufacturing company to build those fuel cells. And uh, GM and Honda will share in the supply from that factory. So that's why I say... 2020 is when that factory is going to begin putting products right, out. Right here, right here in Brownstown. So Are they going to export local. fuel cells to Japan? To build clarities, or are you guys going to no, start building clarities hoping, in America? Well, you know, we build most of what we sell here, here anyway. So part of the reason this car is made in Japan is because the technology is coming from Japan. And I think uh, we'll have uh, this much under our belt, and the powertrain will be more matured, and it's possible, especially if the volume's up. The factories here are all, we're building about 2 million vehicles a year in North America, and uh, maybe one and a half million, 1.6 million sold in the, in the U.S. So those factories are running at a pretty fast clip, making uh, 400,000 CRVs a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, look, uh, we're going to have to cut you loose. I know you got a, a flight to catch here.
But Steve Center, thanks so much for coming on, especially Absolutely. bringing a clarity in the f in the studio with us. This, this is awesome. You're yeah, welcome. Thanks. Enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. We're going to take a real quick break right now. Give a shout out to our friends at Lear. We'll be back to talk about a little bit more. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Yeah, I think you're right. Okay, we're back. And uh, so what do you guys think? You know, I've heard talk of us evolving into the hydrogen economy. Is this it? Are we there? Is this the beginning? Yeah, I, I just, I, you know, as we discussed, I, I just think the competitive set is really tough, uh, as it always has been for hydrogen. I mean, uh, hi hydrogen, all these alternatives are, are great, battery and natural gas, and but the ICE is, is a really tough competitor. And I mean, uh, you know, uh, Steve's an environmental guy, but on the, pol on the politics side, um, you know, the, the, it, I've covered the global warming beat for 30 years, and, and increasingly scientists say it is not a crisis. It's, it, you know, it's something we can, we can manage. And, and I think you see that in the current political climate, you see it in public opinion polls. I, I, I don't think you have this clamor uh, to to uh, reduce CO2 among the public, which I think is required. Well, uh, amongst to, the American public. Yeah. Right. Which that, I think is, is, wasn't there the Paris Accords that uh, yeah, yeah, people signed on to, like, but, globally? Yeah, again, look at Europe. Europe 20 years ago wanted to ban uh, genetically altered crops, which would have been suicide. I mean, that's how you feed the world, is with genetically altered crops. So the rest of the world did not follow Europe down that path, and as a result, it's a little the, apples hydrogen there. Henry, no, but so. the, the United States feeds the world. Right. And by the same, and I'm just saying, in the political environment, I, I think the only way you go to a hydrogen uh, or a battery, which are higher cost alternatives, is tax. You've got to ta you've got to bring the consumer into this. And so you're calling for a carbon tax. Yeah, and the consumer won't they, they won't buy it. They won't have that is that is political suicide. Okay, I see. I would make the argument basically that. Okay, if you look at it from a, a pure market thing, okay, that the, the petrochemicals are a finite fuel. I mean, they're, they're, we're going to run out at some point, right? Yeah. Hydrogen is the most abundant, most abundant element in the universe. It's, it's everywhere. It's but in it, rocks. It's but in, you need energy to get it. You get, right. it, it doesn't exist alone. Right. It, you, you have to do that. But, but it just seems to me that, you know, we, we've had 120 years of internal combustion engine, and so we've basically created this this mindset of that's what cars are, right? So now we, we to, to use another analogy, which is perhaps like your crops, which are a little little fuzzy, but <laughs> so <laughs> since 19... Another environmental scare story. That no, 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 no. I'm just saying, I'm saying, okay, when NASA picked a fuel, what did they pick? Hydrogen, yeah. right? Liquid hydrogen. Yeah. So, Depends so if you're, on the application. But if you, so, if you're in a space station right now, rolling around, and you you want water to drink, where does that water come from? From the hydrogen fuel cell. Exactly. A and recycling. I mean, they're even drinking their own. Right. Sweat I, that's but been recycled. yeah, I didn't want to go down that road. <laughs> and I'm just being polite, mentioning sweat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, so the point is, is that if if we if we'd started with hydrogen, we'd say, oh, you know. But we didn't. Right. So as, as we advance, I mean, it seems to me that this is a sufficiently compelling car in and of itself that as these guys get more production knowledge, as they productionize the fuel cell more and more and more, okay, it becomes highly competitive to anything else. But if I'm Shell Oil, I'm looking at this from the point of view of, you know what? I want to make money now, and I want to make money in the future. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm going to put my bet on that. But, but, and, and this is, the, you know, the, like I say, the, 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 the climate change crisis isn't there. You talk to the scientists, it's not there. No, no, it depends the, on what scientists you talk to, so I, I, we can, I, we can I, politely I, disagree I on to, that. I, I, talk, I talk to the top guys, and, it, and, it, and it's not there. Um, but the reason governments like it is because they can control everything. Carb, car, everything produces carbon. The problem with hydrogen is, is in order to separate it from water, it's enormously energy intensive. If you're in California, how do you get it? Natural gas, 
It, may, it ain't going to come from windmills. I mean, it, this is this is high energy stuff. So, you know, to my point about diesel, at what point does the government say, well, we don't like hydrogen because it produces too much carbon over here. Everything produces carbon, even hydrogen. And so, you know, is, is hydrogen just the trend of the day? I don't think so, because... How does hydrogen produce carbon? Because you've got to separate it from water. I mean, uh, Hydrogen in and of itself is... is yeah, no, but it's, it's the, what it's Henry's talking about is the energy that you need to either reformulate it from natural gas or to use electrolysis. Right. Energy intensive in, in both cases. However, but having said that... What if we use nukes? Well, you know, nukes are another way, but... don't like nukes either. Well... But, you know, what the... Uh, Greens are nihilists. They don't like anything. For, for solar and for wind, what's, you know, they only operate at certain times. And to store it in batteries, very expensive, and uh, you got problems with it. So, you know, the argument is use that electricity to make hydrogen. Because, as, as Steve just mentioned, you can store it for 100 years. You come back 100 years and it's still good to go. So that's... That could actually be an enabler for solar and wind and other renewables. Right. But, but again, I mean, I, I came to this town in 2003. First auto show I went to was, was, the, uh, was the GM's hydrogen car. Uh, um, what was it? Uh, the Equinox. Oh, no, you're talking about uh, the, the skateboard, as the they call it, the, the autonomy. Skateboard. Yeah, this is going to happen in five years. I mean, uh, you know, hydrogen is always... Well, there's years. always been a lot of hype. Right. But, I mean, you we've all driven this car. This yeah. is a terrific car. Right. I mean, I really like it. It, it is. And I like the battery electrics, too. That That's what I wonder is, uh, okay, California's putting in refueling stations. They're probably going to make it work. Steve talked about the Northeast being more difficult. My question always is, what about Topeka? What about right. Peoria? Right. Because if hydrogen cars are only going to be used in uh, certain areas where the governments will liberally fund them, if they don't sell in P Topeka and Peoria, they're going to be very small. They'll never get the scale that they need. They'll never get the cost reduction that they need. To, I mean, how much money is Honda losing on this car? Buckets full. A lot. Lots of it. You know, but I understand, as Steve said, you got to start someplace. Mm -hmm. But, 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 and, and I think that's an important point. I mean, again, this is dependent on government. I mean, the, the, the government is funding all of those. It's now 26. It's supposed to be 100 uh, stations here by 2020 in California. That's entirely dependent on government budgets. Governments are fickle. Publics are fickle. I mean, it, what, what you want is, and I'll use another analogy for you. You want a cell phone analogy. Everybody said there's no way the cell phone companies would get off the ground because the, the, the bells were too powerful. Didn't matter. I mean, as soon as you had public demand for cell phones, the infrastructure exploded. It's all private. It's all private. Billions of dollars in infrastructure. That's what you need. You need the public but to Gary, buy do you, this. Do you think a Shell, for example, because Shell's very bullish on hydrogen. Right. Do you think they'd go and put the stations in? Sure. But it's a chicken and the egg, right? Well, you got to yeah, have but, a car. But, and, but if, if, if we were to look at a map... Shell's not, not going to put them in unless they're... If there's demand for it. But, I mean, okay, but, but sort of to your point, okay, if you look at a map where ethanol stations are are located, right? We're, you know, in, and you're going to find them in corn country. I mean, you're going to look mm -hmm. at this map and they're going to be dotted all over the place, right? Because they have the availability of that stuff. Now, let's say that you begin to have these reformers that can create hydrogen that, you know, General Motors have been working on in upstate New York. I mean, before they decided that their, their future lay with the vault, they were developing hydrogen vehicles. We all drove them. I remember driving an S10 pickup that, that basically had the entire bed was full of a chemical plant, right, to, to drive around to reform the stuff into hydrogen. But as you begin to develop those things and you're able to locate them in Topeka, so suddenly getting hydrogen is not such a big deal anymore. I mean, it used to be, I mean, these guys at General Motors are even saying you could take aftershave, pour it in one of these things, and voila you have hydrogen as a result of it. So if I'm Shell, if I'm Chevron, if I'm BP, you know, I look at this and say, okay, this is, this is another opportunity. It's supplemental. It isn't a replacement. So I think, Henry, that it, it's, it's not going to be a case where, you know, in 20 years from now, we're all going to be driving around in hydrogen cars. But I think what's going to happen is we're going to go from being a monoculture in this industry, meaning we're all driving cars with internal combustion engines, that we're going to be driving, you know, 
Teslas and Bolts. We're going to be driving Clarity, and we're going to be but driving. But is that sustainable in the sense that here's an industry that's already under pressure because Wall Street doesn't like the margins it makes, and it's all about scale. And now you're going to slice it up. So I don't have quite the scale I did in piston engines. I don't have quite the scale in electrics. That's I don't have point. the scale. In, that's what I'm just questioning. Is that a sustainable model? Sure. If if you're a company like Honda or a company like Toyota or a company like Hyundai that's basically saying, you know what, we've got to get ahead of this game, we've got to learn how to productionize this stuff, and we've got to learn how to make profit out of doing that, right? Rather than just saying, okay, we're going to make more cars with, you know, four-cylinder engines, and we'll downsize and turbocharge these things, and we're going to go forward to the future doing that. Because there are going to be other, as we talked many times in the show, that with car sharing, with people becoming disinterested in cars, you know, what's going to happen to scale with that. Yeah. yeah, no, no, exactly right. But, but 15 years ago, 17 years ago, you have a hint, uh, Insight, uh, the Insight and the Prius. Right. The only two market, uh, two hybrid cars on the market. Mm -hmm. Today there are, I don't know, 75, 80? I mean, there are dozens. That, that sounds high to me, but the, yeah, dozens. There's, lots. there's been 50 in the last five years right. introduced. Uh, dozens of choices. The, the, the market share today is, is declining. I mean, and, and so in 2000, who, who, who of us would have predicted gasoline would be 220 a gallon, that fracking would have disco discovered untold reserves of oil, and that the American public would be lot driving less than 3% of hybrids? None of us would have predicted that. Mm -hmm. So that's, I, I think that's, I will that's say this. equally daunting. You know, project. with electrics, you know, we are reaching, I think, possibly a tipping point. You know, the studies would suggest that around 2022, a battery electric will cost the same as a piston engine car. And that that's when we could really start to see things ramp up. So even though I'm one of the ones out there pointing out, hey, look, you know, it's uh, green cars are a shrinking segment. I don't necessarily believe that's going to be the case forever and ever. Yeah. And as you guys know, driving electrics is really good. They're so quiet. I really do like that. They have instant torque. You know, you see an opening in traffic, just tap, tap the accelerator, boom, you're right there. So there's, it's a different driving experience and, a, and in many cases, a better driving experience. And I think people will gravitate towards that once they experience it. Right. But you can't pay a premium and you can't count on government subsidizing it for it to really catch on. It, it's got to be able to haul its own weight, so right. to speak. Yeah, the, the consumer has to have it. And, and, and again, I was, I was stunned because I haven't spent, spent much time with Honda Accord hybrids. You know, the numbers on this are impressive uh, for a hydrogen car. Go to an Accord, uh, half the price of this, same interior space, mm -hmm. uh, hybrid Accord, 750 mile range on the thing mm -hmm. for half the fuel price of this. I mean, again, the, the, the same I, I, companies... I don't think that's right anymore. I think the, the fuel price is the same. No, no. No, what we were paying where we filled up in California was... It was $15 a kilogram. That's right. $14.67 right. or whatever 90, it was. That's $90 for Right, a right. But... Uh, one of the hydrogen companies just announced in California it's dropping the price to 10 bucks. Henry said even a little, I think it's like $9.99 yeah. a kilo. Is government subsidized? Uh, no, no, this is not. I, I don't believe that this is, this well, is the Joel Lewanek company. Right, mm -hmm. First Energy. And, and, and part of it is demand. Okay, you can have less. But, you know, I mean, one of the things we have to think about here, Henry, is, is that if we were to, to go back to the early um, Honda hybrids, they sure as hell were nothing like you know, the full size accord that right. is that is providing that, right? So so here we are at right. the beginning. So we got we gotta keep that in mind. The other but, thing that you gotta keep in mind is as you're looking at the declining sales of, of hybrid and other green vehicles, that there are still some companies that are, are winners in this regard. And so this is my my favorite number, which you've heard probably too many times you're gonna beat me to death if I keep saying this. <laughs> Let's but, hear it. So if you look at Prius sales last year, hundred and thirty six thousand Priuses were sold in the United States, and their number was down. Right. Okay, 85,000 Buick cars were sold. So who's winning there? 85. 85,000 Buicks. Buick cars, okay. not including the trucks, right? Right, right. So Prius, Buick, okay? Yeah. So that's a pretty good delta there, right? Yeah, yeah. I think who's happier? Yeah. The guys at Toyota or the guys at Buick? But, but again, that's, I mean, that's another... You know, that, that's another 
data point, which it should be disturbing to battery folks, is the Prius is, is like 50, continues to be 50% of those hybrid sales. One model right. is about half the sales. That, that, that brilliant Honda Accord hybrid we've been talking about, it's 8% of Honda's California sales. I mean, this is the greenest, most religious you know uh, what? Uh, state in the union, and only 8% yeah, of, no, that, of that, Accord that's sales are hybrid. What I find fascinating is I saw a television ad for the, the new Hyundai Ioniq hybrid. Uh, or not not the Ioniq, the, 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 Nero. the Nero. Thank you. The, the Kia Nero. Never mentions it's a hybrid. Hmm. I think that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. All it does is go, hey, look at this, 42 miles to the gallon, right. or whatever the number is. They never mention it's a hybrid. I personally believe the general public doesn't want a hybrid. Don't want it. It's, it's actually and a market. So I negative. think Hyundai's awakened to this fact and is saying, hey, the Nero, it's cool. But don't talk about it being a hybrid. Although, because I believe the public doesn't want hybrids. No, I think the no. Think about so, so Chrysler or FCA, US LLC. Um, did research before announcing the plug-in Pacifica, remember? And they said they would not describe it as being a plug-in right. because that turned people off. Right. So it I is they both it, it is a hybrid. hybrid. It is a hybrid, right. but it isn't it isn't a plug-in <laughs> thing. Yeah. Because I because I, I mean I, and I'm sure we've all had this situation that you, you, you bring home uh you know a press car that is in a hybrid and, and your your neighbor comes over and says, where do you plug it in? It's just like, well, no, you don't. You just go to the gas station with gas. No, but where's the plug? Yeah. yeah. You know, and this is, this is pre-plug-in hybrids, right? Yeah, but I think it's more than that. I think if you ask the general public, are you in favor of the environment? Yeah. And sure. do you think cars should be cleaner? Yeah. Would you pay more for them? Yeah. And do you want a hybrid? No. They won't pay more for them. But the, but they won't they, pay they, more. They trip but, on but, the, they won't pay more for them. No, they will not. But what they say in the polls, they say they will. But you're right. When they go in the showroom, no, they want the premium sound system and the heated seats, you know. Yeah. But I also believe that people don't want to be perceived, the general public I'm talking about now, as environmentalist tree huggers. And so I think they'd like to say, you know, my Kira Nero. Kira, Kia Nero. Hyundai, yeah, Kia Nero. Thank you, Gary. Gets 42 miles to the gallon. But I think that... He is smart saying, don't call it a hybrid. Well, you know, I, I think you could just weld the hood shut on every car and, and somebody going and buy one, they'd have no idea. You got a four cylinder, six cylinder, eight cylinder, right. 12, nobody knows, yeah. right? I mean, right. who changes the oil? I mean, that's why Chrysler wants to double up with somebody because they just, just make <laughs> just make the same powertrain, please, and call right. it something. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just because it goes to the sound system, it goes to the heated seats, it goes to the reclining, it goes to the leather, yeah. blah, 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 right? I mean... That's that's what it really comes down to. Yeah. But but I mean, the, it, the the bottom line for the customer is 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 price and and utility, and both of those, both of those are enemies of hydrogen and alternative fuels. Now I mean, that's I mean I think your Prius number one reason Prius sales are down is not just gas prices but because California took away their their um, HOV sticker. HOV sticker. You know I mean that's it's that sort of thing that consumer consumer choices rest on. And uh, if, if you're going to offer a hydrogen car that's $10,000 more expensive than the gas version, ain't going to happen. I, I, but see, but I, I think what Steve was saying about, you know, the, these alpha buyers, these are the same people who are, who are buying Teslas, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they want that because it's, it's, it's cool. It's got that, you know, it still has that factor, right? They're rich. And, and and they're rich, right? <laughs> well, rich people buy cars too. I mean, you know, I mean, they're, and uh, so, you know, I'm sure that, that rich people will say, you know, oh, you got a Tesla? I got a, I, I got a fuel cell car. Right. Right. You know, right. I mean, it's just like, so. And, and in the short term, that's, that's what Honda wants. This is a compliance vehicle in the short term. They, they, got, they, got, big, uh, they got big regulatory numbers to meet from the state of California. They got to sell, you know, 15% of their sales have to be zero emission by 2025. See, but and this thing, fuel cells Couldn't you make the argument, though, that, 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 that Honda may be one of the companies that doesn't need to worry so much about a compliance vehicle? I, I think they're going to be fascinating to watch. I mean, they, they are out there. This, this promise of two-thirds of vehicles being electrified by 2030, I mean, that's just around the corner in terms of product yes, cycles. It is. That's a huge commitment. So I, it's, a, it's a great company to watch because mm -hmm. we know how good their engineering is. That's right. I mean, Hey, look, guys, we're going to have to wrap it up. We're at the end of our time here. But, Henry, thanks for stopping by. John, Always Gary. good to have you here, Gary. You guys. And yeah. Let's do it again, Gary. All right.
Cool. Okay, I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.